Yeah, sure. This is my friend Greg Brown um, and my new friend Marley. <laughs> uh, Greg's a dog lover and he's trained with police dogs and self-defense dogs and attack dogs. And being in that culture, he's met a lot of people who have done the opposite with dogs and uh, trained them to fight. And he's known people who've trained, trained fighting dogs and fighting dogs themselves. And he is... Uh, very knowledgeable in the whole culture and the history of uh, pit bull and fighting in general. I mean, I had a lot of uh, stereotypes in my head about dog fighting, and he's put them to rest and told me a lot about the history that I had no clue about. I thought dog fighting was a new fad, but it's been around for hundreds of years, so I'll let Greg tell you the history. All right. Well, just, uh, this, this outline is just the brief bit is talking points, and the rest of it is... Uh, some other information I've gathered. There's a state guide. There's a don't mind him. There's a state guideline list in here where it has everything is being marked as a felony, what's a misdemeanor, and what's legal. And just you, know, you guys have seen Marley. You guys have seen how he is with strangers. Owning this dog is a felony in the state of Massachusetts. Owning this dog is a felony in the state of New Hampshire. Owning this dog is a felony in about 35 other states. Um, the training of a fighting dog. It's a felony in most states. In very few states, is it even legal to watch a dog fight or be a participant at an event? Um, it's illegal in all 50 states. Um, this is some other smaller stuff in here. Rewards for information on dog fighting. And then there'll be a couple other things I'm going to touch on as we move along with this. But I'll start off with a brief history of dog fighting. People have fought animals for thousands of years. Um, the best case of this would be the Colosseum. Um, they used to have the Roman war dog. It was three war dogs to a lion, four war dogs to a bear. And they'd fight them for the enjoyment of the Colosseum. Um, moving along, we're going to start looking at the development of pit bulls and dog fighting, because the two <laughs> are synonymous, because the development of the dog parallels the development of the fighting. And the majority of the dog fighting that developed these dogs was in the UK, Ireland, and then eventually the last 150 years has been in the United States. The development started with ratting and badger baiting, where you take a smaller game terrier and you put it in a pen with 20, 30 rats and see how many it could kill as quickly as possible. Um, people would bet on it. It was originally designed as a test of gameness. Now gameness is something that you'll hear a lot about talked about with these dogs and gameness is the willingness for a dog to continue to fight and maintain a certain level of intensity on a goal all the way through. A, uh, fighting dogs can, is called dead game because this dog in Marley has unfortunately been proven to be a dead game dog. He will fight until he dies. He won't stop. There's nothing that can slow him down. They try to do the same thing with, with smaller terriers for keeping houses free of rats and eventually for the hunting of badgers. So people would selectively breed for dogs that were aggressive towards smaller animals. That's why you get Jack Russell Terriers that are absolutely insane. Everything's just small, cute, little fuzzy animals, but they are, they're a handful. Any terrier is driven, no matter what kind it is. It might be scared of people, but it's driven to catch something. If it moves, they're going to chase it. Um, you start breeding for the gameness, for the aggression, and you start breeding, see people start breeding for a certain skeletal type even. With dogs that were involved in badger baiting, they started breeding for dogs with slightly sunken in eyes with a higher subcranial ridge to protect their eyes from when a badger would gouge at their face, make, to prevent the dog from going blind. Um, moving along, the bear baiting, and that developed the mas for the mastiff breeds, because what ended up happening was that the mastiffs were used in the 1600s in Europe as castle and estate guardians. Now you can't generally find a man who's going to subject himself to fighting a dog to test to see if the dog will do its job. So they figured we can, we can catch a bear and make it stand on two legs, chain it to a wall, hit it with an oar if it decides to play around a little bit too much. And you started developing these as working, working tests for the dogs, as a breed suitability test pretty much. And that bred along, and that was in the 1600s, and kind of fell out of favor as the industrialization of the world happened. As things became less and less rural and more and more urban, 
no one really needed these bigger Mastiff bear baiting dogs, so they fell out of favor. In the early 1700s, the development and the popularity of bull baiting in the UK exploded. Now originally what ended up happening was somebody figured out the best way to breed a bulldog was to breed a, was originally thought as a white, a white Highland Terrier with a Mastiff. And that's where you get the original strain of these dogs. And just for a matter of, a matter of, uh, it was actually discovered the best way to breed these dogs and to get consistent results out of your breedings was 26 generations of breedings that were either hit or miss and there was no middle ground. Um, bull baiting was both popular and legal. There were three bull baiting pens in downtown London that, bull, that baited bulls twice a day. The bull would have usually a handful of powder blown up its nose and be chained to a post and then let the dogs go and see if the dog grab it by the, by the snout and hold it. And you know, the dog held the longest from getting flipped around was the winner. And it was a breed suitability test. Um, Mr. Perkins, uh, I tried as hard as I could to find the guy's actual name. This is a, is a, a paper published in, in 1632 called Cases of Consciousness. And it's a pretty good quote to show you what the outlook on bull baiting was in Europe at that point in time. It's, under, it's right here on those talking points. Um, that it was actually illegal to slaughter a bull in England unless it had been baited. Because they figured out that once the bull was in a fight with a dog, their muscles would fill with blood and it actually made the meat taste better. Because at that point, we weren't dealing with domesticated livestock. You were typically dealing with three quarter or half wild animals. And one of the biggest things that a bulldog would do or a butcher's dog would do is if a bull broke out of a pen and started running through the city goring people, it's a heavy liability for the butcher. It's a heavy liability for anybody. So a good bulldog was considered a hero because those dogs would stop a bull from running through the town killing people. And that would typically happen in an urban environment. Now, but with the change of livestock, to being slightly more docile, less aggressive, smaller horns, and just overall being an easier animal to deal with, bull baiting fell out of favor and actually was finally put to an end with the Cruelty of Animals Act of 1835, which was an act of parliament, and it forbade any kind of fighting or baiting of any animal whatsoever. Now, an interesting fact, the English Bulldog that everybody's seen as the AKC shows, the cute little things, the scruffy face that everybody says was that's what an English Bulldog was. That breed wasn't developed until a uh, few decades. It was, I think it was about 50 or 60 years before you start seeing anything like that considered a Bulldog. And if you look at paintings, or you know, mostly paintings from the 1600s of Bulldogs, not one of them looks like one of those short little can't get out of their own way, English Bulldog. Now dog fighting really developed, really came into its own after that happened, after the Animal Cruelty Act, because what ended up happening was people no longer needed Bulldogs, but they had dogs that were game. So what would happen was people wanted something small that they could keep in the house, could protect the kids against rats and different, different smaller animals that invade the smaller houses and infest the homes. So they started breeding for dogs like this, and they could also fight a man if, if needed. And the breeding suitability test that they, pi they picked out was matching two dogs against each other. Now originally this is being done as a, an idea of seeing if the dogs had pure gameness, to see if the dogs would fight, and, and that was it. They'd do it once, maybe twice, and that would be the end of it. Because you'd never want to risk the life of a dog that you could breed to make money off of, because you know, this dog's dead game and I know it is and you can advertise that when selling puppies. So it was really driven, dog fighting was really driven by the idea of making money breeding dogs. And this is, you know, early, early to mid 1800s all the way up through the 1900s. Um, dog fighting was outlawed in the UK, but it was done anyway. It was legal and sanctioned in the United States up until the 1900, early 1900s. In fact, if you were looking in 1905, if you're looking for a place to go get to see a good dog fight, go to Boston. The best fighting dogs in the world were imported into the city of Boston. In fact, one of the most, one of the most prolific game dog breeders in the United States is the Colby family of Newburyport. 
where they kept a house or a barn for fighting gamecocks, a house for fighting dogs, and then the house for the family. And to this day, they're on their 20th generation of dogs, and there's a nice little statistic that a 20 generation pedigree for a puppy has 2,097,152 ancestors in it. That's how many dogs have gone through that house since 1889. Um, continued legislation has led to dog fighting being a crime in every state and a felony in most. The biggest hit to the underground world of dog fighting was definitely the arrest of Floyd and his Floyd Bordeaux and his son Guy Bordeaux of Louisiana. Floyd Bordeaux was the dog man of the mid 1900s. Like you see uh, pictures from the 50s. He's in his 70s now. He's up for 57 felony counts of animal cruelty, and those 57 counts are carrying a 10-year charge each. So it's a life sentence for him. His son will be charged with the same thing. Um, it was, you know, mostly for transporting <coughs> fighting dogs over state lines, mostly federal cases. They're going away forever. And the sad part about that was they euthanized every single adult dog on his yard. And they said, because it's the very common misconception that a dog that's been fought or a dog that's been trained to fight or bred to fight is dangerous. That's where Marley comes into this little speech. And this is the second biggest thing to happen. One of the, one of the worst things to happen to the pit bull and period is not so much the dog fighting by guys like that because 1950, 1930, if you're going to a dog fight, you're wearing a suit. If you're in the pit with your dog, you're wearing a suit. It wasn't, it wasn't done in back alleys. It, you know, was, you know, there wasn't, the name of the game wasn't cruelty at that point in time. Um, it's one of the things that's been really blown out of proportion. A lot of it has to do with the hip hop culture that has embraced, embraced these dogs because they're tough and impressive looking dogs and people torture them to get them to be guard dogs. They, these dogs are not human aggressive. For 250 years, these dogs were bred selectively for zero tolerance for human aggression. Because in a dog fight, you have to break the two dogs off of each other and at the height of intensity, if that dog turned and bit a handler, they would legitimately take it out of the pit and shoot it in the back. And that'd be the end of it. Those dogs were not tolerated. They were culled instantly. Purebred, line bred, traditionally bred fighting dogs like Marley are a non-issue as far as human aggression goes. It's the really the big the big problem with that is the sensationalization of dog bites on the news. And the biggest problem with that is if you look at how many people are bit by pit bulls annually, it's less than one quarter the amount of people that are bit by um, Springer Spaniels, Cocker Spaniels, they bite three times as many people as pit bulls do. The only problem is when your dog has the muscles in its mouth that looks like it swallowed half of, a, half of a tennis ball on each side of its cheek, it does a lot more damage. And what ended up happening is that people have punished these dogs based on the actions of their irresponsible owners. A responsible owner, doesn't matter what kind of dog it is, you would never leave a child alone with a dog. A responsible owner would have appropriate steps to keep a dog from escaping a yard. And a lot of people assume that since they have a pit bull and it's friendly and it's nice, it doesn't mean that that dog isn't, you know, a lot of people have been, you know, a lot of child, children that have been bitten by pit bulls, it's been out of prey drive. There's just a, there's a couple different ways of looking at it. Dogs in general operate on prey drive and defense drive. And everything else from there is kind of a derivative. Food drives based off of prey. Um, aggression is based off of defense. Those are the two main drives as the way that animals work. Cats are a perfect example of an animal that is 100% pure prey drive because a cat will run at the first sight of trouble. Fight or flight. Now what ends up happening with these dogs is that they have an enormous amount of prey drive. All their training, everything that they do is based off of the idea of the chase and getting themselves to a point where they can get whatever it is and that's what their goal is because if, if it moves fast they want to chase it, they want to jump on it, they want to put their mouth on it because that's what they do. 
These dogs weren't pets. These dogs were working dogs for 200 years. And the fact that they've been brought in and guys cut their ears off, which was never done in dog fighting circles. They never cropped the ears because the ears are actually cooling fins. If you look at a big, the bigger the dog, the hab usually has bigger and floppier ears for the simple reason that dogs only sweat through the pads of their feet and their mouth. So they pump all their blood through their ears to cool them off. The best way to find out if a dog's overheated is to grab a hold of his ears. See how hot they are. If a dog's, you know, you can, if a dog's dead cold, you grab their ears, their ears are not that warm. You know, and you can actually see the veins expand and contract if you have a dog with bigger ears and a lighter skin pigment. So that's, that would never be done. They'd never cut the tail off those dogs because that was never done, but that's also something because people want a tougher looking dog. Dog has no tail, dog has no ears. Now you can't read its body language whatsoever. Can't tell if it's wagging its tail, can't tell if its ears are back, can't tell if its ears are at half rows, nothing. Put a big two inch wide spiked leather collar on it and a giant heavy chain around it which is detrimental to the dog's health. It d destroys the dog's neck and spine. It is a huge cause of deteriorating osteoporosis in pit bulls that have been walked w on a heavy chain their whole life is that it pulls down so much on the neck and will actually cause spinal erosion in their necks. Um, the, one of the most visible, well, two, the two most visible arrests as far as dog fighting goes was the rapper DMX was arrested and charged and convicted on two counts of animal cruelty for starving animals for the 25 animals he had in kennels that were full of urine and feces in his basement and obviously Michael Vick. Um, that's the one thing Michael Vick is getting a slap on the wrist <coughs> compared to what other guys have gotten. Um, you know, Floyd and Guy Lebeau, Lebeau old school dogmen, you know, one of the things that they were arrested with was enough injectable euthanizing agents to kill every dog in that yard. Michael Vick strangled his dogs, hung them, and drowned them in five gallon buckets. There's levels of cruelty that are everything, you know, everything involved in the, the art of dog and the sport of dog fighting or as they romanticize it and call it the fancy. Everything about it is cruel. It's not done. The dogs do it because they love the person that's their handler. They will go to the death for you. You put them in that pit, that dog's gonna fight because you put them there. You know, these dogs have been bred for two hundred years for animal aggression, so an uneducated person with a fr oh I bought, I bought my first dog what do you get a pit bull that's a bad idea <laughs> that's just a bad idea all the way around rescue a pit bull no you rescued a cute little six month old pit bull puppy because let's face it they're cute as hell and you rescue a six month old dog at nine months all of a sudden it wants to kill everything on four legs most of the time you'll never see that aggression change from dogs to people and anytime there was a dog like that they were put down those are those were what are considered breedings of curs. A cur dog is a dog that wouldn't fight, that would give up, jump the pen, and run. Now what has happened since people can't, you know, people haven't been, they've been improperly breeding these dogs because they're a fad breed, is that you've started to see dogs that are bred from animals that would never have been bred 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 200 years ago, would are now being put into the gene pool. So now you're starting to get the development of traits that have been bred out of these dogs put back into the bloodlines. So purebred fighting dogs like this don't have human aggression. He may very well protect somebody in a life or death situation, but a golden retriever would probably protect somebody in the same life and death situation. The thing you have to worry about with these dogs is small four-legged animals, cats, squirrels, possums, skunks. Those are a very, a very big part of this. Um, you know, so kind of touched on threats to the pit bull worldwide. One of the biggest ones, of course, is breed specific legislation. Like the pretty much, they call it an ordinance in Boston, but it's a ban. Let's be very, very honest about it. When you, when you are required to spay or neuter your dog at your own cost, you're not alone to own more than one, um, oh, what other fun ones are there? has to have a, have a muzzle on at all times, be leashed at all times, 
anytime that dog is out of your actual house. So he's in my apartment, muzzle's off, no, no big deal. He goes in the backyard, muzzle has to go on. Now, the one thing I've been waiting for, which is, hasn't happened yet, is the pit bull owner whose dog is mauled by a dog aggressive Malamute, Husky, Akita, or any of the 20 or 30 other breeds that are very prone to animal aggression. And as soon as that dog gets mauled and doesn't have the tools to defend itself, City of Boston will have their lawsuit. Because you've effectively taken away the ability of the dog to defend itself. It's like declawing cats. You know, a lot of places consider that cruel because the cat can no longer defend itself. Same thing with these dogs. And the blanket term pit bull that is put on these dogs is also very unfair. Um, included in that pit bull ban in Boston is a Staffordshire Bull Terrier. Marley here is 68 pounds. A Staffordshire Bull Terrier is no more than 26 pounds. It's pretty much a milk crate with little stubby legs because they're kind of built that way. They're about that wide and about that tall. Um, they have always been, since the 1800s, considered the stay-at-home brother to these dogs. Those were the dogs that you saw in homes. My grandfather had two of them that he brought over from, from Ireland. You have pictures in the house of him with, this is the 1930s, 1940s. You have pictures of him with two small red Staffordshire Bull Terriers. They're a home dog. They're a house dog. And the second being people who, fad breeding, which we've already talked about, people who deal with a hip-hop culture, also something that they've done that's been extremely detrimental to these dogs is pit bulls were never supposed to be bigger than 65, maybe 70 pounds. 70 pounds would be a freak. But those big blue pit bulls, the blue whales that have now verged on the point of being so wide in the chest that they're no longer agile, they're no longer mobile, and they weigh 120 pounds, they, those aren't pit bulls. Those are something completely different. A working pit bull is lean, agile, and fast. Now, nationwide, there are more than a few different organi a few organizations. Most local organizations will offer rewards for people who have information on dog fighting and leading to an arrest or even more, even more money is involved if, it's, uh, if it leads to a conviction. Humane Society, I have a couple listed here. Humane Society, the Defense of Animals offers a $2,500 reward for an animal that's been stolen, usually mostly for pit bulls, for the specific reason that people will steal pit bulls to fight them. And one of the next thing I have on this list here, uh, I think it's on the third page or fourth page, is the item, the list of items considered de facto proof of dog fighting. Now this has been put out, and this is pretty much a standard list. This one in particular is taken from the Oregon Humane Society, but this is pretty much a standard list, whether you're looking at the MSPCA, the ASPCA, Humane Society of America, most local rescue organizations, this list is a standard. Now just signs, just read over it. And I'll touch on each one. One of them is multiple pit bulls in one yard with locked and or privacy gates. Now the big problem with this is that if you have more than one pit bull, you are going to have a locked gate on your yard. You're going to have privacy fences because those dogs, you can have kennel fights. Two dogs on each side of a fence. You look at me, you look at me, and we're going to fight through the fence and probably break all of our teeth off in the, in the process. But privacy fences, the dogs can smell each other they just can't see each other, which is the inciting factor. You have a privacy locked fence. You're right, you do. If you're a serious breeder of any dog, you know, I know guys who train dogs for my friend John, who trained my dog, as I've worked with and done decoy work with for police departments. He trains 45% of the dogs for the U.S. Customs Department. He has a yard of dogs that are each individual dog is sold for $5,000 a piece, 30 to 40 dogs at a time. And these are all, Mal you know, obviously these are Malinois or Shepherds. These are police dogs, but the same thing. John has 10-foot pri privacy fences and two sets of locked gates before you even get to the kennel yard. That's responsible dog ownership. Pit bulls with short cropped ears wearing two-inch wide collars. I think I've covered this part. That's, those are fads. A lot of dogs have two-inch collars. Marley's wearing one right now. My dog at home wears one for the specific reason with a dog that's this strong and this powerful, if he decides he's going to hit the end of the leash and he's got a you know, half inch wide nylon slide or nylon choke, he can crush bones in his throat. A two inch wide collar like this distributes the pressure on their neck and it's actually safer for the dog. You won't find a police dog that didn't start its training out wearing a two inch wide collar. 
that's a standard for all working dogs. Dars, dogs with scars on their head, their throat, and their legs and ears. And that's, that's a pretty universal. You know, my dog, never been, you know, not a, not a dog aggressive animal, has been attacked in the past. He has three scars. If you lift, if you push his fur aside, he has three deep scars on his shoulder from getting bit in the shoulder and locked onto. You know, a dog goes running through the brush. If it's, you know, gets out in a more rural area, your dog will come back with scars from running through the brush. You know, I'm sure there's enough briars and thorn bushes out there to cut your dog up pretty good. <laughs> you know, dogs can also be attacked being the cause of the scars. Dog might not be involved in the fight at all. You might have a pit bull that has wants nothing to do with fighting another dog, and another dog gets loose and mauls your dog. Your dog's going to be scarred. Tires are leather suspended several feet off the ground to provide jaw strengthening ac activities. This is exercise. It's called a spring pole. Now, the, the typical way of doing it is you hang usually an inner tube over a branch, a garage door spring from that, and a piece of rope connected to some sort of tug toy, whether it's a piece of jute, a sleeve cover. A lot of people use those for like, the big sleeves that you see the canines biting. They'll use a sleeve cover, or they'll use a piece of raw raw cowhide. Now, not raw hide that you buy in a store, legitimately just a scraped off and treated piece of cow fur. There's hair on it, whole nine yards, and it's durable, and these dogs can chew on it forever. And all they do, and this is actually something that's been, that they've been doing for a long time, it simulates the bulldog's drive to grab the bull and to shake. So it grabs a hold of the tug, it shakes, it, the spring bounces them side to side, and the dog loves it. There's actually some good pictures. Um, I'm going to give a couple websites and a couple books if you guys want a little more information at the end of this. And one of the websites actually has a woman who set up a spring pole that's 14 feet tall to the spring, and it shows a dog swinging 18 feet off the ground. Because they will do it until you literally, the only way you're getting them off the spring pole is to tell them to get off. And because typically they'll just sit there and shake it all day long because it's fun. And it's exercise for these dogs. You have a hyperactive working terrier, which is what the pit bull is, you need exercise.